Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to my show, Preterism Changes Everything. This is Jen Fishburne. Hope you guys had a great weekend. So we are ready to dig into chapter three in Genesis now. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started with uh, my version again. Now the serpent was more shrewd than any other living being of the garden that Jehovah had made. He said to the woman, did the Elohim actually say that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but the Elohim said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not dying, you will die for the Elohim knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like the gods, the Elohim, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was desirable to the eyes and that the tree was to be coveted to be prudent or wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Now, let's look at a few words here and then we're going to talk about this passage. <clears throat> so we're going to start with serpent again. So there's more that we need to learn about the serpent. So the serpent, uh, the word for serpent is nakash in Hebrew, which we looked at already. It can mean um, a viper serpent, a viper. The viper serpent has the big head, right? Um, so it's definitely more of a type of that kind of a serpent. It's not just your little slithering snake. This is like the big grandiose type, you know, the, the most powerful, the most magnificent, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, some, some places even, um, actually refer to it as a dragon. Now we don't actually know what a dragon looks like. We don't know if that's real. We don't know what that means, but, um, it has more of a connotation of a dragon than just a little slithering uh, black garden snake, that's for sure. Okay, now nakash can be either a noun, a verb, or an adjective in the Hebrew, in the, in the Hebrew root, okay? So the noun part simply means serpent, just like what we've seen in all the verses that we looked at, and uh, so that's really easy to see, right? Um, the verb means deceiver, or diviner. So uh, we know that this being was definitely a deceiver, um, but what was a diviner? So a divine just means uh, pertaining to the heavenly realm, to the divine realm, and it just is pertaining to gods. Gods can be a divine being. Uh, there were many, many, many gods. We're going to see more and more of that, and they were all divine beings. There's more than one divine being. So when people ask me about um, the divinity of Christ. Um, I don't think that they understand what the word divinity means. In fact, I don't think most people in the church understand that. So it just is pertaining to the divine realm. That's all that it means. We've made it into something more than it really is. All right. So, um, if it was a God, then it would definitely be a diviner, right? Um, now the adjective form means shining one or a brass covered one. So brass is shiny. So they kind of go together there, right? Now, Dr. Michael Heiser proposes that all three of these, um, the noun, the verb, and the adjective are in play here. And that the nakash of Genesis three is just a triple entendre or, or a three way play on words. So this was a God from the divine realm, the heavenly realm, who took on the earthly form of a serpent, but not just an ordinary snake, but a beautiful bronze shining serpent with a big viper's head, very likely. And maybe he even had wings like a dragon and he deceived Eve. All right. Now the book of Jubilees is not in our Bible, not in our canon, but it is in other Bible versions, uh, especially the Ethiopian Bibles. And in our Bible study, we're going to be looking at many non-canonical books. 
Now I know not all of you are going to be a fan of this and that's okay, but um, I think that they inform us of what the Israelites thought during that time period, what their history, their language, their culture was like, and I think it can just provide a lot of extra um, good information for us to understand more about what is going on in the Bible. Um, so the Book of Jubilees is considered a pseudopiga, pseudopigographical work. I didn't say that right. Pseudopigographical work, which basically means that the author is unknown. Now, some are going to claim that uh, pseudopigographica means a forgery or a fake, but I don't think so. Um, we don't have the same level of reliability as we do um, with the books that we have in our modern day Bible, but it doesn't mean that we should not study them for added insight. So the Book of Jubilees was probably written about 150 years before Christ, and um, they found 15 scrolls of Jubilees at Qumran, which is more than all of the other canonical books, almost all of them, except for just a couple. So it was very widely in use there. All right, so that tells us at that time, a very, very, very popular book. Um, many of the early church fathers also used the Book of Jubilees and often quoted extensively from it. So um, we know that before, uh, for 100, 150 years before Christ to uh, a few hundred years after Christ, uh, the Book of Jubilees was a very, very widely used book. So whether it is 100% true or not, I don't know, but it does inform us on what they thought during that time period. Okay, so that's how we're going to use it. So the Book of Jubilees is also called the Lesser Genesis and um, because it tells the same story as Genesis, but with additional detail. And I find it interesting to see how they thought during the time of Jesus. <clears throat> so I'm going to be sharing extra information from various non-canonical books to just add perspective. So you're free to believe them or not, as you will. All right. So. We're going to start with uh, some information here from the book of Jubilees. Did serpents talk? So I know some people, um, especially in the preterist circles, will make fun of people who believe in talking snakes. First of all, it's not a snake. <laughs> Let's make that clear. Okay. This was a God. Um, so God spoke and gods could take on any earthly form that they wanted to. And uh, this particular time, this God took on the form of a serpent and it was a majestic being. It was not just a slithering snake. All right, so, however, it seems that it was common not only for the gods to talk, but for all the animals to talk. So let's see what Jubilees has to say about this. In Jubilees 328, and on that day, oh, this is a uh, context here is speaking about um, after the fall of Adam and Eve. So it's shortly, maybe a few visits, for, few verses later than where we're at right now, but it's going to inform us of what we want to know. And on that day was closed the mouth of all beasts and of cattle and of birds and of whatever walketh and of whatever talk moveth. I guess I spoke King James in the book of Jubilees <laughs> so that they could no longer speak for they had all spoken one with another with one lip and with one tongue. So, Without all the King James, they were saying basically all the animals spoke. Everybody spoke the same language, and in Midrash commentary, it tells us that that language was Hebrew, that, that both man, animals, and all of the heavenly beings all spoke Hebrew before the fall of Adam. And then after Adam and Eve sinned, then the animals no longer spoke. Um, and then once the Tower of Babel happened, um, <clears throat> uh, no one spoke Hebrew on earth. I'm sure it was still spoken in heaven. That's what they tell us. Um, and then until Abraham came along and an angel came down, according to Midrash commentary, an angel came down and taught Abraham how to speak Hebrew again. Now we don't know about all of those you know, different details. That's just what they believed at that time. But what I found interesting here was that um, it seemed to be well received that all the animals spoke before the fall. All right, so 
A talking snake? No, not really. But a talking serpent? A talking viper? A talking dragon? A talking god? Yes, that's what we're dealing with here, is a talking god. So what is... Um, <clears throat> Oh, my notes here. Um, so this was a serpent, a viper, a dragon, a character. Um, it was not just an animal, but was a god in the form of a serpent. Um, Adam probably would have known him as simply one of the Elohim, one of the gods. There would have been no reason at all for Adam and Eve to be surprised that he spoke to them. And we see in other books that um, we're going to take a look at a little bit later that he continued to speak to them after the fall as well. Now let's look at a couple other words here. Um, our room is uh, crafty or shrewd or sensible. I chose the word shrewd, um, but it basically means very practical. I was kind of surprised at this. It reminds me of uh, many of our Facebook conversations when somebody is nitpicking the details, and um, but in reality, they're actually correct. So um, it's, uh, you know, when we have the word they're crafty in our Bibles, it makes it, it, makes it sound like, um, you know, something really bad, but this is actually can be used, it's a, it's a good quality that's used in a negative way is what this is, is talking about. It's something very, very practical, very, very sensible, but it's used, it's spun in a negative way. All right. So I thought shrewd seemed to answer both sides of that. Okay. The word for field there that we have at the, the beginning, let me get back to that real quick here. Now the serpent was more shrewd than any other living being of the field that Jehovah had made. Um, first of all, I'm going to um, just use Jehovah instead of the Elohim Jehovah anymore. Um, so you guys can start to learn the difference between where Jehovah is used, which is a name, and where the Elohim is used, which just means the gods or the God. Um, and so I think it'll be make it easier for us to distinguish it. So Jehovah made the garden, basically, and the serpent was more shrewd than any other living being of the field that Jehovah had made. Now the field is just a, a piece of land, but if we look back at all the times that the word for field was used before this verse, it was all referring to the Garden of Eden. So I just went ahead and put garden there just to make it easy to understand. But the word for field there is um, sade, and it just means the same piece of land as the Garden of Eden. Okay, then we have the word for, uh, I, I put in there, dying you will die. I know it sounds strange, but I want to emphasize the word there is very strongly emphasized, and uh, it's muth in the Hebrew, and in these passages it, here, Today, it was muth muth, which means the super, super strong, the strongest emphasis you, that you can give on dying. So it would be like, uh, Eve, if you eat that, you're going to die. <laughs> I don't know how else to, to explain it. And, um, and the serpent's like, hmm, no, that's not going to happen. All right. The last word we want to look at here is uh, chakaur. And that's a loin cloth or a loin covering. So it was just enough to cover their private parts, but no boobs. So um, kind of uh, interesting there. All right, because sometimes we kind of think that Eve was covering up more than Adam, but it doesn't seem like it. it doesn't seem like it. All right, so so far in the story, we have a god who is a slanderer and an adversary to Jehovah in the earthly form of a viper or a dragon, uh, whatever that might be. He probably lived in the Garden of Eden with many other gods as well. Now the imagery of the Garden of Eden is that of a place that where the gods would dwell, quite possibly on a high, men, a high mountain. So there's probably many gods living here. Now this shiny viper serpent god does not use Jehovah's name. But he asked if the gods really told Eve that she couldn't eat from any of the trees in the garden. 
knowing full well that she could, but he was just planting a seed of doubt, right? So Eve, like a good girl, answers back with the accurate statement of what they can and cannot eat. Notice that the uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil is in the midst of the garden, not necessarily in the middle of it. Uh, just a minor point there. Adam and Eve do not know right from wrong at this point. So in our minds, we're kind of like, how could you do this? How could you possibly do what you were told not to do? But because we've known right from wrong pretty much all of our lives, <laughs> from shortly after we were born, we figured it out. Um, we do not know how, what they were thinking, what it was like to not even know that. They, uh, they don't know what right from wrong is until they actually do wrong. So they have no idea what death is, even though Yehovah may have explained it to them or the gods may have explained it to them. Um, we know in other books that the gods explained tons and tons and tons of things to not only Adam and Eve, but other people as well. Um, but unless you have actually um, seen death, it's very, very difficult to understand what that means, what that concept is, right? All right, so then the, the shiny viper serpent God says to Eve, oh, you will not die. You will be just like the other gods if you eat from it, knowing good and evil. Now he was very, very shrewd, all right? This is kind of tricky here because in a way he was right. If they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would know good and evil. And until you know evil, you have no idea that that's a bad thing. I'm sure Eve just wanted to be like the other gods. He also told her that their eyes would be opened, and they were. And he told her that they would not die. And it doesn't look like they did, but we'll get to more on that later. So this slimy, shiny, viper serpent god was very shrewd indeed. He kind of told her the truth, but he deceived her as well. So Eve coveted the fruit, when she realized that it would make her like the other gods. The, few, the fruit was beautiful. She had her first craving and she just had to know what it tasted like. Notice that Adam was with her during this whole time, apparently saying nothing. And he just let Eve try the first bite to see if she would die first. Nice guy. When she didn't die, Adam took a bite to see what was so good about it. Then their eyes were opened just like the shiny viper serpent God had told them. And they saw that they were naked. And they didn't die, just like the shiny viper serpent God had told them. And now they knew good and evil and experienced shame for their wickedness, just like the shiny viper serpent God had told them. And so they covered up their private parts by sewing undies out of fig leaves. I would really like to know how they figured that out, out how to sew like that. All right, now tomorrow we are going to see what Jehovah has to say about all of this. You guys have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.